The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to start, I, I was told to kind of stall maybe a little bit to let a few more people come in. So I'm going to just start by saying that this is going to be a very different talk I think than you've heard previously um, and that I am not an epidemiologist and I'm not a clinical uh, a research scientist and I'm not a geneticist. I am actually a hardcore cell and molecular neurotoxicologist and so I'm coming at this from a very different perspective than many of the other people. Oh, I was too far away? I was warned to be away from the podium, so okay, we're, we're getting everything set up here. Um, one of the questions actually that I was just discussing prior to being introduced is what is it about organophosphorus pesticides that, that parents and clinicians could maybe test for in their kids to see if the kids have been exposed or even if moms have been exposed during pregnancy. And remind me to come back to that at the end. But this is actually a very tricky class of compounds to deal with. You've, if you've been here for the last day and a half, you've heard a lot of mention already about organophosphorus pesticides. They're sort of at the top of everybody's hit list for environmental factors that may be um, a risk factor for autism spectrum disorders. And one of the questions is, why is that? And we're going to get into that a little bit today. And then while I'm stalling one more minute, waiting for a few more people I see at the back there, uh, I would also like to point out that as a neurotoxicologist, I would like to educate you all in that they are not organophosphates. An um, organophosphate is actually the compound that's created in your body when it's metabolized, but they're actually organophosphorus pest pesticides. Um, so if you say organophosphate, a neurotoxicologist will run from the room because they think you're talking about nerve agent. So just uh, be careful when you're referring to these compounds. All right, so I guess I'll launch into the proper talk now. And so you've already heard a lot about this in the past day and a half, but I'm again going to tell you what I think about this conundrum that we call autism spectrum disorders from the perspective of a neurotoxicologist. Um, to reiterate some of the previous uh, conversations and talks that you've heard, that I think it's pretty well the consensus in the field now that really ASD reflects interactions between gene and environment. And one of the things I would also like to, in to integrate into this discussion is it's not just the genetic susceptibilities and it's not just the environmental factors that are important, but I was the one who raised the issue earlier this morning, it's also timing. Timing as to when these environmental exposures occur is absolutely going to change the developmental profile of the brain in very different ways. We know this exquisitely from the fetal alcohol syndrome uh, literature, which has been around for a long time, and we have a very good understanding of that particular syndrome. And it's very clearly been documented, not only in animal models, but also in humans, that the timing at which the developing brain is exposed to ethanol makes a huge impact on what the clinical manifestations are going to be. So it should not surprise us that the same thing is true when we start talking about other environmental factors other than just ethanol. And so as a neurotoxicologist, I'm going to talk to you about these organophosphorus pesticides, but it's very important to remember, again, the time that these are present in the developing brain will have a huge impact on which regions of the brain are going to be affected and what the final clinical outcome will be. And this is on top of the genetic variability that you've heard so much about already, and also the fact that organophosphorus pesticide exposure does not occur in a vacuum that you have to set in the, this in the context of the envir other environmental factors that are at play during this exposure. And so these can include other environmental chemicals because as you heard from Bob Navio earlier this morning, we're basically swimming in a soup of environmental chemicals. So you have those on board, but also there's, there's other environmental factors that are equally important, including the nutritional status of the individual, which you've heard about from other speakers at this conference, and also the socioeconomic situation, stress levels, maternal uh, and uh, pat uh, paternal parenting skills. All these have a huge impact, and so the organophosphorus pesticides are going to play out against that particular background. So one of the things that I've not heard, maybe I missed something yesterday, but there, there's been a lot of talk that we're pretty convinced now that it's interactions between genetic susceptibilities and environmental factors that really are going to determine risk for autism. They not only turn, return, determine risk, however, but they also probably have a huge impact on determining the severity of the clinical manifestations. This 
very diverse background that sets the stage for risk probably also explains why we have so much variability in the clinical outcome that are seen in autistic patients. It also probably determines treatment outcome. Why is it that one treatment works in one child but not in another child? Again, all these variables are going to impinge not only on risk but also on severity of outcome and treatment outcome. So I think we're at a point where there's this growing consensus that we have these very diverse factors that are, are playing together to determine risk severity and outcome. The next question that we're really trying to get our hands around, and you, I, don't, I don't know that you've heard a lot about this yet at this conference, but I'm going to try and tackle it a little bit with you, is how do genes and environmental factors interact with each other? What are the mechanisms at the level of the molecules and the cells in the nervous system and the other systems in the body that are impacted in autism, such as the immune system and the gut, that really, you know, how are they being affected by these interactions? Can we really get our hands around that? Understanding that is going to be important for two reasons. Number one, it will lend credence to the epidemiological studies. So we have all these very elegant epidemiological studies that have been done, but until there's a biological mechanism to explain the association that's been noted in the epidemiological study, people are always going to find fault with that epidemiological study. So it's going to be really important to really, again, confirm and expand our understanding of the epi epidemiological data. The second thing is, if we really can get a handle on how these factors are working together to perturb brain development or immune development or both, then this may open up some new insights as how do we not only prevent the effects from occurring, but also trying to rescue those individuals in which the events have already occurred. So I am a member of the Center for Children's Environmental Health at UC Davis, which is very closely affiliated with the MIND Institute. And a lot of the work that I've done has been done in collaboration with other scientists there. And one of the rubrics that we're really exploring in our laboratories is that one possible mechanism by which heritable genetic vulnerabilities could amplify the adverse effects that are triggered by these environmental exposures is if both factors, the environmental factor and the genetic factor, converge to dysregulate or interfere with the same signaling system at critical times of development. Now, I want to put a big caveat here. I don't think this is the only mechanism by which genes and environment can interact. Certainly, there are many other mechanisms that have been proposed by other people. Epigenetics is a big one that you've heard about a lot. But this is another way to look at how it is that these factors may be interfering with each other, interacting with each other, to push the developing brain over that balance into clinical manifestations of ASD. So, that's sort of the background against which I'm going to talk to you about these OPs, which is the acronym I'm going to use because nobody ever wants to say organophosphorus pesticides more than a couple times. So OPs is going to be the acronym that you'll hear me using. And, and why is it that we think that these particular compounds, environmental compounds, may be potential risk factors for ASD? Well, there is some epidemiological evidence out there that has implicated OPs as ASD risk factors. So you heard about one uh, this morning that Dr. Herbert discussed, and that's uh, represented here again with the reference. It was a study that was done by Brenda Eskenazi here in California, in which they actually did link perinatal OP exposures, these were specifically to OPs, to increased incidence of ASD. Um, there have been a number of other epidemiological studies that have demonstrated that in the human population, OPs do interfere with neurodevelopment. And again, Dr. Herbert showed you one of those this morning with the drawings of the Mexican children that were either grown in the presence of high exposures to pesticides or in the presence of low exposures to pesticides. So we're pretty sure the OPs are neurotoxic to the developing uh, nervous system, the human developing nervous system. We're positive that they're developmental neurotoxicants in animal model systems. So two very good reasons to suspect that OPs might be ASD risk factors. The other thing that I would point out that was another smoking gun that really got people interested in OPs in the context of ASD were studies that were done um, by a, a number of groups, actually. I have a couple, just uh, two of them uh, represented here, in which that they showed that there was increased susceptibility to ASD uh, that was uh, really as associated with polymorphisms in paraoxinase 1, affectionately referred to by those in the, in the uh, field as PON1. PON1 is a key enzyme that's involved in detoxification of these organophosphorus pesticides. 
The interesting thing about these epidemiological studies, however, is that they were not replicated across the world. So a number of groups in different regions of the world tried to replicate these initial studies and were not able to do so. And when they really started to pull these studies apart and do sort of a meta-analysis of all these epidemiological studies looking at PON1 in the context of ASD, one of the things that fell out is that you did not see the association between this polymorphism and ASD in those areas of the world where there's not high usage of OPs. You only seem to see it in those regions of the world where there was relatively high usage of OPs. So again, another indicator suggesting that potentially OPs are risk factors for ASD. So now we enter the world that I'm much more comfortable with, which is cell and molecular mechanisms of neurotoxicology. If indeed OPs are risk factors for ASD, then one would assume that they're interfering with some aspect of the developing brain that we think is involved in the pathology of ASD. Now that's been a pretty tricky wicket to really handle because as I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar, there's still a lot of controversy as to what the pathology of ASD really is. Um, however, I think it's fair enough to say at this point that there's quite a bit of evidence both in the human literature and in the experimental animal literature that suggests that autism, like many other neurodevelopmental disorders, really reflects altered patterns of neuronal connectivity. So before I go too much further, I just want to stop and, and go back and define what a neurotoxicologist means by altered patterns of neuronal connectivity. What I have down here on the bottom is a schematic of a circuit between two neurons. Here is one neuron with the cell body. A single neuron typically extends two types of processes. One type of process is known as a dendrite, and there are typically numerous dendrites per neuron. So you can see three dendrites coming off of this particular neuron. Neurons also extend a second type of process known as an axon. And most neurons in the mammalian brain, including the human brain, will extend a single axon. And here's the axon for the neuron in this particular schematic. Most of the time, unless we're talking about uh, insects, uh, these dendritic processes are the primary site where information comes into any given neuron. And there will be other neurons that make contact with this neuron that I'm talking about right here. These are the afferent inputs or the incoming information that are going to form a synapse, which is a point of contact, between these two neurons in the circuit. So information comes into the dendrite or into the dendritic arbor. These so form sort of a tree-like structure when you look at them morphologically. Information then passes down the dendrites, is integrated in the cell body, where the neuron then makes some sort of a uh, decision as to whether to pass this information on in the circuit. If the information is passed on, it's typically passed on through the axon, which is known as the efferent, or the outgoing process of the neuron. You can see that this neuron then makes a synapse on a downstream uh, neuron. So again, now this is the presynaptic neuron, this is the postsynaptic neuron, and the synapse is the point of, con of contact between these two. So when we start talking about connectivity, what we're really talking about are the patterns of connections between these neurons that are making up functional circuits in the brain. And these, uh, this neuronal connectivity is really defined by the morphology of the axons, the dendrites, and the synapses. All right? So changes in dendrites, changes in axons, changes in the patterns of synaptic contacts are going to change the way information is processed through the brain. So it changes the direction of information flow. It also changes how that information is perceived and integrated within the neuron that's receiving the information. Okay, so as a neurotoxicologist, when I hear people say that autism reflects altered patterns of neural con connectivity, I immediately think about changes in the circuitry at the level of the structure of the neurons. And one of the things that I think is really important that I would like to um, emphasize a little bit in my talk this morning is that most of the conversation about neuronal connectivity in the field of autism really revolves around the developing brain. And certainly that is very important because that is the seat of social behavior in a human. However, I would also like to remind you that neuronal connectivity is important not only in the developing brain, but it's also very important in the autonomic and sensory nervous system. 
And there is um, increasing evidence, I think clinical evidence, that there are dysfunctions of both autonomic and sensory uh, behavior in autistic children. And so we're, I'm going to show you a little bit of data looking at some of these OPs and how they affect autonomic and sensory neurons as well. I would also like to point out before I move on, uh, a, a talk I saw by Pat Levitt probably about uh, five years ago when I was still in Oregon. And he was the keynote speaker, uh, speak, speaker I should say, at a conference on autism that we had at OHSU. And um, I almost fell out of my chair because he got up there and he said, I think the root of autism is the autonomic nervous system because the autonomic nervous system controls behavior indirectly through its effects on the central nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls the immune system and the autonomic nervous system controls the, the gut, the GI tract. And so this could be the integrating center of a lot of what we think of as the triad of symptoms that we see in ASD. So, I'm not sure that I buy that lock, stock, and barrel, but I think it's a very important uh, sort of insight to think about. And so when we start talking about neuronal connectivity, it's important to compare what's happening in the peripheral nervous system as well as in the central nervous system. Okay, so a little bit more about ASD pathology. So again, there's a sort of growing awareness that neuronal connectivity is altered in autism. Um, I think the, the cell and molecular mechanisms that underlie the changes in the neuronal connectivity are still not clear, but certainly we have a lot of evidence that there may be changes in the way synapses are formed or are maintained or the way dendrites grow out or the way axons grow out. There's also some evidence that at least in some forms of autism, there's an imbalance in the ratio of excitatory and inhibitory circuits within the developing brain. So in a normal brain, the excitatory and inhibitory circuits are imbalanced with each other. And so changes in one will be modified by changes in the other to correct that balance. In ASD, there seems to be an imbalance such that there's increased drive in excitatory circuits and decreased drive in inhibitory circuits. Whether the same thing happens in the autonomic nervous system is not quite as clear, but there certainly is evidence to, to support that. There's altered tone of the autonomic nervous system. So coming back to the cell and molecular processes, we have this change in neuronal connectivity, we have these imbalances in excitatory and inhibitory drive in the central nervous system and potentially the peripheral nervous system as well. As well. We also have quite a bit of evidence that suggests that the interruptions that occur in setting down those patterns of neuronal connectivity are happening during the development of the brain. So going back one step farther, what are the neurodevelopmental processes that determine neuronal connectivity? Could they be the, the timing or the process that's being disrupted by these environmental and genetic risk factors for ASD? So from a very high view looking down at the developing nervous system, there are a number of processes obviously that influence neuronal connectivity, but there are five major processes that really stand out. These include the processes of neuronal migration. So as many of you may know, the brain actually starts out as a tube in a developing human uh, and this has to then uh, differentiate into the brain and into the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. So all the neurons that form the mature nervous system start out as a single plate of cells in this developing tube. So the single plate of cells has to divide it, um, and proliferate and differentiate into neurons and glial cells, and then they have to move from the site of birth to their final resting spot. This is a very um, tightly orchestrated process that's controlled by a lot of factors in the, the environment of these developing cells. So neuronal migration is critical to determining where the neurons end up. And there are a very large number of human disorders that have been described as defects in neuronal migration. Uh, AST, there's still some debate whether neuronal migration might contribute to this or not, but certainly there are other well-defined syndromes in which disruptions in neuronal migration have given rise to clinical outcomes. Another very important aspect of determining neuronal connectivity is interneuron development. So I think a lot of developmental neurobiologists tend to focus on the major cells involved in excitatory pathways in the brain, so the pyramidal neurons of the hippocampus, for example, or the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. But these cells um, have to be moderated by other cells, smaller neurons that are in their environment that basically are the brakes on their activity. And these are known as interneurons. They're typically inhibitory. And so there are a number of labs that have shown that 
But interruptions with the development of endoneurons can also lead to functional deficits in the uh, developing brain. And there is some kind of interesting experimental evidence coming out of the lab again of Pat Levitt suggesting that perhaps some of the genetic risk factors that have been associated with ASD are very tightly tied up in the development of interneurons. So those are two very early events that have a big impact on neuronal connectivity in the developing brain. But there are some later events that are absolutely crucial to really laying down the final patterns of the circuits that form the functional brain. These include axonal growth and branching. So as I described, the neuron has to migrate to its final resting place. Once it reaches that point, it typically has some very rudimentary processes, but it does not have its mature axonal and dendritic arbor yet. And so the later stages of development involve this neuron putting out an axon, which finds its way through to the environment to its postsynaptic partner, which will then form a synaptic contact with. This is not a random process. These axons don't just willy-nilly go out into the surrounding environment and try and find a partner, a synaptic partner, but rather it's a very guided process. And there are cues along the pathway of the axon that really guide it towards its final spot, towards its postsynaptic partner. Once it reaches its target, it then has to differentiate into a presynaptic terminal and then it has to form branches. And all those later stages are really defined by experience. This experience could be inflammation. It could be visual input. It could be um, any kind of a stimulus that causes that neuron to respond to it. So there are all kinds of stimuli, all kinds of experience that will refine the final branching patterns of those axons. On the other side of the neuron, we also have dendrites that are being formed. This happens a little bit later, typically, than the axon outgrowth in most cell types. And again, the final number of dendrites, the final shape of the dendrites, their branching patterns, all of these are going to be very much modified by experience in the environment. What kind of experience is that neuron undergoing while it's putting out these dendrites? And then finally, we have synaptogenesis. Now, one of the things I do want to point out to you is I have the word plasticity in here. It turns out that in setting up these mature neural circuits or determining neuronal connectivity, plasticity or the ability to change the structural components of axons and dendrites and synapses is critical. We also know, even in old people like me, that we still have dendritic plasticity and synaptic plasticity ongoing. These are critical to learning and memory. So not only do we have neurochemical changes occurring in the brain, we also have these structural changes occurring in the brain where synapses and or dendrites are eliminated or they're formed, they change their strength. All of these are a very important part of a functional brain. There's evidence that the pruning that occurs naturally during development of dendrites and synapses um, can go awry in the human brain, and this can give rise to clinical symptoms. So, for example, schizophrenia has been tied to inadequate or insufficient pruning of dendrites during critical stages in puberty. So anyways, these are sort of the big um, neurodevelopmental processes that we know contribute to neuronal conductivity. So the question that my lab has been investigating for the past, uh, I guess, probably now seven years, is whether or not these OPs can alter neuronal, uh, neurodevelopmental processes that determine neuronal connectivity. So what do we know about OPs coming into this picture? Well, as I said, OPs, or organophosphorus pesticides, are known neurotoxicants. This has been known from, uh, for a long time. Excuse me, I have something in my mouth here. Um, and they were actually developed as compounds that would uh, be neurotoxic. And their primary target is acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme found at synapses of cholinergic neurons that basically breaks down acetylcholine into the building blocks choline and acetate. So this is a very important natural break on cholinergic signaling in the brain. Acetylcholine is released from the presynaptic neuron, diffuses across the cleft, and binds to receptors in the postsynaptic neuron. And the way that signaling is terminated is through breakdown of acetylcholine by acetylcholinesterase. So OPs will inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And as a result of that, there'll be a significant increase of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. 
This will lead to overstimulation of those postsynaptic receptors, and with time, that meaning a couple of hours to a couple of days, you'll actually see a downregulation of the cholinergic receptors on the postsynaptic side as a compensatory mechanism for that increased acetylcholine. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with acute OP toxicity, but it basically causes a syndrome known as cholinergic toxicity. Anybody going through med school or vet school learns it as dumbbells. So it causes parasympathomimetic effects in the periphery, and it can cause convulsions and coma um, effects in the central nervous system. So uh, what we have over here on the left is just a uh, sort of schematic of the three-dimensional structure of acetylcholinesterase. It's a very large molecule. There is an active site in the catalytic groove that actually binds acetylcholines. This is acetylcholine right here. That's the uh, neurotransmitter. And will hydrolyze the breakdown of the, as I've said, into choline and acetate. And you can see the schematic of the enzymatic reaction here. So here we have acetylcholine binding to the unoccupied receptor that releases choline. And we have an acetylated acetylcholinesterase molecule. That will re quickly release that acetyl group, and that's released as acetate, regenerating the native enzyme. This is a very quick catalytic conversion. When OPs come on board, they actually bind to the same active site, to the catalytic site, but it's an irreversible reaction. And so they block that such that acetylcholine can no longer access the site. So many people um, have shown that when you inhibit this acetylcholinesterase with a, by acute intoxication with OPs, you have very pronounced neurotoxic effects. There are cholinergic deficits that have been documented in ASD, but it seems very unlikely that this mechanism is at play for two reasons. We don't see cholinergic toxicity symptom, symptoms in a, um, kids that are presenting with ASD, and most of the levels of OPs that we're exposed to on a daily basis are not sufficient to trigger this acute um, intoxication. So we really got interested in OPs because about the time that um, the first epidemiological studies were suggesting that perhaps these might be associated with ASD, there was a series of papers that came out in the developmental neurobiology field saying that acetylcholinesterase, that enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, is not only a catalytic enzyme, but it actually also functions as an axonal morphogen. So what does that mean? Basically, morphogens are chemicals that are found, usually in a developing system, that promote some sort of developmental process. So what we're saying here is that acetylcholinesterase promotes outgrowth of axons in developing neurons. So some of the evidence to support that is that acetylcholinesterase is expressed by non-cholinergic neurons during periods of axon outgrowth and synaptogenesis. Actually, it was this observation that really got developmental neurobiologists very interested in acetylcholinesterase, because why would a neuron make this huge molecule, it's very expensive to make these molecules, if it weren't functional for some reason? They're not making acetylcholine, they're not responding to acetylcholine, so why do they need acetylcholinesterase? So they went in and did some studies with pharmacological inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase and found that they could actually block axon outgrowth both in vivo and in cell culture at concentrations that do not alter the catalytic activity of acetylcholinesterase. Further studies that involve genetic manipulations of acetylcholinesterase expression in cultured neurons showed that you could also alter axonal outgrowth. So if you overexpressed acetylcholinesterase, this would increase axon outgrowth. If you suppressed the expression of acetylcholinesterase, that actually decreased axon outgrowth. So some pretty convincing evidence that at least in these model systems, acetylcholinesterase could influence axon outgrowth, which we know is a very important determinant of neuronal connectivity. So the hypothesis that we specifically set out to test was that OPs disrupt axonal growth by interfering with the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase. If this hypothesis is, is correct, we predicted the following. First of all, the OPs would inhibit axon outgrowth even in the absence of acetylcholine. So if this were acting independent of its catalytic activity, we should not need acetylcholine present in our system to see an effect on axon outgrowth. Secondly, we should see inhibition of axon outgrowth independently of effects on the catalytic activity of acetylcholinesterase. And then third, that we would not see any effects on axon outgrowth in neurons that did not express acetylcholinesterase. So to do these studies, we used the OP chlorpyrifos. 
Um, this is a compound that belongs to the phosphorothionate group of pa pesticides, so referred to because they have a sulfur group here. Um, this compound, the parent compound CPF, is not thought to be neurotoxic by most neurotoxicologists because it does not inactivate or inhibit the catalytic activity of acetylcholinesterase. Rather, the parent compound is taken into the system. It has to be metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme, which is a mitochondrial enzyme. And this converts it to the oxone metabolite. So you can see the sulfur has been removed, and we now have an oxygen. This is the form of the compound that is a very potent inhibitor of the catalytic activity of acetylcholinesterase. It is detoxified by the enzyme I referred to earlier, parioxinase, to form the leaving group, which I'm not going to pronounce that word because it's after lunch, and it's uh, known as TCP. So this is a pesticide that currently has been banned by the US EPA for use in the home. However, it's still very widely used in commercial settings, including to control cockroaches in both schools and in tenements and in, in inner cities. Um, I have a whole other story on CPF and asthma, if anybody's interested in that, but, but that, I digress. So the other thing is it's also still used in flea dips and, um, and as I said, roach control sprays. So in this country, it was one of the most widely used OPs, which is one of the reasons we focused on it. It's still a very widely used OP in this country. And in other developing countries and industrialized countries, it's extremely widely used. So if you go to China or if you go to India or in a, uh, we have a project actually in Egypt right now, chlorpyrifos is the most widely used on, on, on a tonnage basis of all the OPs. And actually, China is increasing its use of chlorpyrifos. So the model system that we use to test whether or not chlorpyrifos would interfere with axon outgrowth are primary cultures of sensory neurons that were derived from mouse dorsal root ganglia. So dorsal root ganglia are found in humans as well, and they're one of the primary sensory neuronal cell types that we see in the periphery. And they, uh, dysfunction in DRG neurons in humans has been implicated in ASD. One of the reasons that we chose, actually several reasons, that we chose DRG for our neurons, uh, for our set of studies, I should say, is that they only ex extend axons. This is true both in vitro and in vivo. We wanted to have not be able to have, to, uh, I'm sorry, we wanted to not have to determine whether the effects were on axons or dendrites because we wanted to specifically look at axons because that's the process type that had implicated in the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase. The other more important reason for uh, choosing this particular cell type is that they've been shown previously to respond to the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase. And then secondly, we could culture them in the absence of serum. This is really important because there are, a lot, there are very high levels of acetylcholinesterase and butyl cholinesterase in serum. So this is what happens with the DRG when we put it into culture. It starts out life after we isolate it from the um, animal as a, just a, a round ball. And within 24 hours, it starts to extend a process which will differentiate into the axon. So here's some real pictures of real neurons. Uh, these are after 24 hours. The top panel shows you a picture of a DRG neuron that was grown in our vehicle. So this is what we use to suspend the CPF in, and you can see what the sort of endogenous rate of axon outgrowth is during this 24 hours. The cell body, the axon, and a growth comb, which is finding its way through the environment to look for a target. Here's a culture that was set up at the same time, so sister culture from the same animals. And we can see that in the presence of CPF for those 24 hours at this concentration, 0.1 micromolar, there's a significant decrease in axonal outgrowth. If we quantitate those data, these are the types of, uh, of results that we obtain. So looking at the number of axons per neuron, we see the endogenous level in the vehicle controls. And over this concentration range of either CPF, that parent compound, and you notice this is a micromolar, or the oxone metabolite, which is um, also, I'm sorry, is a nanomolar, that we really have no effect on the number of axons per dendrite. However, we have a very significant effect on the total axonal length, and this is a dose-dependent effect. And one thing I would like to draw your attention to, that we see effects with CPF, the parent compound, at levels as low as 0.001 micromolar, and with the CPFO at levels as low as 0.01 nanomolar. So these are very, very low levels. Now, one of the things that a neurotoxicologist is always concerned with when they see this kind of effect, is it really a specific effect of the neurotoxin or neurotoxicant on axonal outgrowth, 
Or is it just merely reflecting the fact that we're killing the cell? The cell's just not happy. As Bob Navio was showing you today, mitochondrial uh, activity is very important in cell health. Maybe we're just knocking out the mitochondria and these are just not happy cells, so they're not extending axons as readily. So we actually did look at cell viability, and we did a number of different assays, including one that looks at mitochondrial viability. And you can see that over the same concentration range that we saw effects on axon outgrowth, we don't have any change in cell viability relative to our vehicle control. So that's not the explanation. We also looked at the effects of these compounds on protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is important for axon outgrowth, and Ted Slotkin at Duke had a number of papers showing that these compounds inhibit protein synthesis in the developing brain. So we did the experiment by looking at the integration or incorporation of tritiate leucine, which is one of the um, amino acids that's important in protein synthesis. And you can see that treatment with CPF over the concentration range where we saw effects on axon outgrowth did not change the incorporation of leucine, suggesting it's not changing protein synthesis. The addition of cyclohexamide, for those of you who are interested in that, it's a protein synthesis inhibitor, so we'd expect that to knock down protein synthesis. So this just basically tells us that the leucine incorporation we're seeing in the absence of cyclohexamide really is reflecting protein synthesis. So here's the real important one. Does this happen independent of effects on the inhibition of the catalytic activity of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? And so to do this, we actually measured ACH enzymatic activity. You can see what it is in our control cultures that are exposed to vehicle alone. And then there is a dose-dependent inhibition of ACHE enzymatic activity in the cultures exposed to either CPF or the oxone metabolite. However, it's important to note that we really don't start to see significant decreases in this activity until we get to concentrations of 0.1 micromolar for the parent compound and 0.1 nanomolar for the oxone. These are considerably higher than those lower doses where I showed you that we were seeing um, inhibition of axon outgrowth. So at this point, where do we stand with respect to our hypothesis? Does, do OPs disrupt axonal outgrowth by interfering with the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase? I hope I've shown you data that convinces you that we can at least rule out this mechanism. The OPs are not working by inhibiting the acetylcholinesterase catalytic activity to increase acetylcholine levels, which are known to drive down axon outgrowth. So that leaves two options. Either they are inhibiting the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase, thereby decreasing axon outgrowth, or they're acting in a molecule other than acetylcholinesterase. So to address this question, we took advantage of the acetylcholinesterase knockout mouse, which was derived by Oxana Lockridge. These are litter mates. On the right, we have the wild-type mouse. On the left is a ACHE knockout uh, litter mate. So you can see there is a phenotype associated with this um, uh, genotype. However, much to, I think, the scientific world's amazement, when Oksana first published the papers describing these mice, these mice will survive over 450 days, which in the lifespan of a mouse is a really long time. Um, but they will only do so if you hand feed them. Because of the lack of acetylcholinesterase, they don't have sufficient strength in the jaws and um, the muscles of their jaws to chew regular mouse chow. So they have to be fed a liquid diet daily for all that period of time. They do have other problems. They have sensory problems. They don't reproduce, and it's not because they don't have the right hormones, but they just literally don't have the sensory cues to respond to each other, and they also have problems with thermal regulation. So these are not normal mice. But much to everybody's surprise, they actually do survive. So we took advantage of these. Oh, this is just to show you, for any of you who are scientific buffs out in the audience, that in this particular knockout, it's not just that you make a truncated version of acetylcholinesterase or you make a mutant acetylcholinesterase. Truly, she's knocked out the gene, so they don't express any acetylcholinesterase at all. And that was proven by both southern blots, which looks at the DNA itself. Here is the band that you get from a wild-type mouse. So this corresponds to the size of the number of bases that you would expect in the intact gene. In those animals that have um, the knockout, we can see that we don't see that band. Instead, we see a band at a much lower size, uh, and that's because of the way they designed their primers. Or the, for the southern, they actually are looking on either ends of the target deletion of that particular gene. And then in the heterozygotes, those who express one wild-type allele and one mutant allele, you can see you get both bands. By PCR, which looks at the messenger RNA level, again, you can see what we see in the wild-type. Here's the knockout animal, the nullozygous for the acetylcholinesterase, and we don't see the band corresponding to acetylcholinesterase mRNA, and you get both bands in those heterozygous animals. 
And then at the level of the protein, because we heard this morning you have to look at the level of the protein, that's very important. You can see in the wild type animal a histological stain or histochemical stain for acetylcholinesterase. We get very dark staining in the brain. Um, and then those animals that are nullozygous for the acetylcholinesterase, we see no staining. So these animals truly don't make acetylcholinesterase. For our culture systems, we had to be able to predict at the time we take the cells out of the pups what the genotype was. Genotyping usually takes a day or so to get it right, and so we de determined that we could actually predict the genotype on the basis of the acetylcholinesterase phenotype in the em embryonic uh, rat SC, uh, brains that we were taking from these animals. And so you can see in the nullozygous animal, we have very, very low levels of acetylcholinesterase activity. This basically is background. It's nothing at all. And in the wild type, we get a much elevated level of acetylcholinesterase, and in those heterozygous animals, we have an intermediate level. So during our dissections, we could actually take the DRG out um, and then take the brains, figure out the ACHE genotype of those animals, which we always went back and confirmed by PCR later, and then be able to play our cultures and know what the genotype was. So what happens in this case? So here we have um, on the top two panels images of neurons, DRG neurons, that were deri derived from the wild type animal. So they expressed uh, two copies of the ACHE gene. And on the bottom we have photomicrographs of neurons that were derived from the ACHE nullozygous animal. On the left are the neurons that were exposed to vehicles. So if we look just at the vehicle exposures, we can see already that in the ACHE knockout neurons, there's less axon outgrowth per unit time than there is in the wild type, which again confirms the previous literature suggesting that ACHE is an axonal morphogen. Now this is where it gets interesting. Look what happens in the CPF exposed cultures. In the wild type, as we previously showed you, there seems to be a decrease in axon outgrowth relative to the vehicle control. However, if you look at the neurons that are derived from the knockout animals, it looks like there's really not much change in axon outgrowth relative to the vehicle control. Indeed, when we quantified our data uh, using morphometric analysis, that's what we saw. So on the, this is looking at CPF exposures. Again, we're looking at total axonal length. On the left are the data from the neurons that were derived from the ACHE wild type animals. On the right are the data that were derived uh, from neurons that were taken from the, the knockout or the nullozygous animals. As previously shown, CPF causes a, a concentration dependent decrease in axon outgrowth in the wild type neurons. However, in those neurons from the uh, nullozygous animals, we don't see any effect of CPF on axon outgrowth. And the same thing was observed when we use CPFO, although again we're using a thousandfold lower concentration of CPFO. So, um, and this is a real primer on how cell and molecular neurotoxicologists spend their days, I guess. So I hope uh, you're, you're not getting too bored by my excitement over these cell and molecular data. But one of the things that we always have to confirm is whether or not when we knock out that gene, we're just deleting that gene, that there aren't off-target effects. And so in order to look at that, we asked whether or not we could basically put wild-type acetylcholinesterase back into the uh, null zygous neurons and recapitulate the wild-type phenotype. And so to do that, we characterized uh, both our full-length wild-type acetylcholinesterase gene, which will be represented in the following slides by just PACHE. So this is a plasmid that encodes the full-length wild-type ACHE. We also wanted to know whether that serine residue, which is a site where both acetylcholine and the OPs bind, was critical for the effects of the OPs on axon outgrowth. And so we mutated the wild-type acetylcholinesterase by converting that serine to an alanine. And these data are just our control data showing you that our plasmids are doing what we expect them to do. So if we take either COS7 cells, which are really easy to transfect and we get very high transfection efficiencies, versus our DRG from the nullozygous animals, which are a little more difficult to transfect and our transfection efficiencies are not as great, what happens with respect to acetylcholinesterase activity if they're transfected with just GFP, which is a reporter enzyme that lets us know which neurons were transfected, versus that plasmid that encodes the mutated acetylcholinesterase versus being transfected with the plasmid that encodes the wild type ACHE. And so you can very clearly see here that both GFP and the mutated ACHE construct did not increase ACH activity in either COS7 cells or DRG neurons that were um, cultured from those nullozygous animals. However, in both cell types, when we transfected in the wild type ACHE, we get a very significant increase in acetylcholinesterase activity.
So to confirm that the reason we did not get a response here in the cells that were transfected with the mutated ACHE wasn't simply because the mutation somehow changed the way that protein was being trafficked in the cell or the way it was being expressed, we did a messenger RNA in a Western blot, and I'm showing you the Western blot here, to confirm whether or not we actually have protein being expressed in our cells that were transfected with that plasmid that was mutated, and indeed we did. So now, the real interesting part. What happens when we put the, these plasmids back into neurons that were derived from the nullozygous animal? And so to walk you through this, the top are these DRG neurons that were cultured from the knockout animals that were transfected with our control plasmid, with the GFP. And we're showing you both an image of just the GFP, so you know it's a transfected cell, and that same cell that was immunostained for neurofilaments, uh, which is a marker of neurons, so we know it's a neuron that was stained. And this is what happens in our vehicle control. You can see sort of the background level of axonal growth we see, and then what happens in CPF. And similar to our previous studies I showed you, we don't really see much change in axonal growth in those neurons that are treated with CPF versus those that are not. Now what happens when we take these nullozygous neurons and transfect them with the plasmid for the wild type ACHE? Now all of a sudden, when we look at what happens in the vehicle, the axon length looks greater than it did back up here with those same neurons that were transfected just with PGFP. And now we actually see there's a response to CPF. So we appear to have recapitulated the wild type phenotype by re-expressing wild type or full length ACHE in those nullozygous neurons. And um, those are the data that are presented here. So again, we're looking at total axon um, length. These were neurons that were cultured from these nullozygous ACHE animals. And as I showed you previously in the photomicrographs, transfection with either PGFP or the mutated ACHE has no effect on axon outgrowth. But when we put in that um, wild, light, wild type or full length ACHE, we actually recapitulate the wild type phenotype. And the neurons are now responsive to, uh, to OPs. Okay, so that was a lot of really hardcore cell and molecular neuroscience. I'm going to whiz through some of this and get to some of the more interesting potential gene environment interactions that may be relevant to autism. So we went on to ask the next question, which is whether or not these OPs might also interfere with dendritic growth or were the effects really selective for axon outgrowth. As I told you earlier, the DRG neurons don't extend dendrites, either in vitro or in the intact animal. And so we turned our attention to the sympathetic neurons, which are cultured from SCG or superior cervical ganglia. So these neurons have been implicated in ASD as being somewhat dysfunctional. When you put them in culture, they again start out life as a single round ball. Within 24 hours, they extend axons, and this is known to be sensitive to acetylcholinesterase. So acetylcholinesterase is a morphogen for these neurons as well. And within three to four, five days, if you expose them to the appropriate environmental stimulus, which in this case is bone morphogenetic proteins, they will put out dendrites. So this is a model system that we used. And here's a picture of what we saw. So as with the DRG neurons, sympathetic neurons that are exposed to chlorpyrifos exhibit decreased axonal growth within the first 24 hours of culture. However, if you look at what happens to dendritic growth, particularly BMP-induced dendritic growth, at seven days in culture, and to do this we look at a MAP2 immunostain, which is a biomarker or an immunocytochemical marker for uh, dendrites, we can see that chlorpyrifos actually seems to increase dendritic arborization. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these data, just the other to say that in this system, the sympathetic nervous system, we can see that the chlorpyrifos, as we saw in DRG, is decreasing axonal length. And this is true for CPF and CPFO, so the black bars and the white bars, but not for TCP, that final metabolite. So that's the hatched bars, and you see no effect relative to the vehicle. In contrast, if you look down here at dendritic growth, we can see that CPF, CPFO, and TCP all increase dendritic arborization relative to the vehicle control. The other important point of this slide is that the concentration um, effect response is very different. So we see the effects on axonal um, growth occurring at much lower concentrations than we see with the effects that are occurring on dendritic arborization. And I'm not going to walk through this one. So, I, these findings suggest that CPF and CPFO, but not TCP, inhibit axon outgrowth. 
This effect requires acetylcholinesterase, but occurs independent of inhibition of the catalytic activity of ACHE. So our conclusion at this point is it appears to be mediated by inhibition of the morphogenic activity of ACHE. And these are two separate functional and structural domains within the acetylcholinesterase molecule. So what does this mean in terms of AST? It means that at levels, exposure levels, where you're not seeing inhibition of acetylcholinesterase, which is the biomarker the EPA recommends for determining whether or not somebody has been exposed to, to OPs, at these levels, you're still having an effect on a very sensitive aspect of neurodevelopment that is critical to setting up circuits in the developing brain. So that's the important point of all that stuff I just told you. Um, we also see from our data, however, that CPF, CPFO, and TCP can enhance dendritic growth. This is not mediated by inhibition of acetylcholinesterase either, even though the effects are only seen at concentrations that also inhibit acetylcholinesterase. The fact that TCP, which does not inhibit acetylcholinesterase, also inhibits dendritic growth says it's occurring through mechanisms independent of the inactivation or the inhibition of acetylcholinesterase's enzymatic activity. The mechanisms are totally speculative at this point. So the bottom line is axonal outgrowth is a very sensitive endpoint. But I would also say that what these data are telling us, in addition to the fact that we have effects occurring at levels that we can't detect with the biomarkers we're currently using to monitor OP exposure, is the fact that the outcome at the level of the neuron in the developing brain is going to be very dependent upon the concentrations that the brain sees. And so this is another reason why I think it's been very difficult for the epidemiological um, studies to really pinpoint environmental risk factors because A, they occur in the context of genetic variability and they occur in the context of a, a very diverse environmental exposures, but also the same compound can give us very different effects depending upon the concentrations to which the brain is seen or being exposed. Okay, so now, this has all been in the peripheral nervous system. And so many people that I know in, AS, in ASD research will say, okay, that's very interesting, but really we want to know what's happening in the central nervous system. So we did that study, and we looked at hippocampal neurons. And here's what we found. Chloroperifos doesn't do anything to axon outgrowth in culture hippocampal neurons, nor does it do anything to culture cortical neurons. The reason we now know is because these neuronal cell types do not respond to the morphogenic activity of acetylcholinesterase. So does that mean that these OPs may not be interfering with neural development in the, devel in the central nervous system? And the answer to that is, no, that's not exactly what it means. And the reason why is the following. It turns out that there is a great deal of structural and functional homology between acetylcholinesterase and neuroligands or neuroligands. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I'm not sure what the, the consensus is in this audience, so I'm going to say neuroligands. All of you are probably very well aware of the fact that mutations in neuroligands have been strongly linked to ASD. So we look at the schematic up here. Here's neuroligand. As many of you probably know, it binds to a uh, counter ligand on the opposing side of the synapse known as neurexin. And so if you look at the neuroligand, you can see there's an acetylcholinesterase homology domain in that very large extracellular compartment. It's been shown by a series of very elegant studies um, that were conducted by Hermon Sarek and her colleagues that you can actually exchange acetylcholinesterase and neuroligand in cell culture systems, and they will functionally replace each other. So if you knock acetylcholinesterase out of a cell and you see decreased axon outgrowth, you can actually recover that by putting neuroligand back in. Vice versa, if you knock out neuroligand, you can recover the cell's function by putting acetylcholinesterase in. So they are not only structurally but also functionally homologous. Um, the other important point, as I alluded to here, is that these are going to bind to norexin, and you can see a schematic of this over here. So this is supposed to represent a uh, dendrite. Here's a dendritic spine. So this is the postsynaptic surface. Here's the presynaptic surface. You can see that neuroligands are expressed here on the postsynaptic surface. The um, norexins are in the presynaptic surface here, and these two basically will stabilize synapses. 
It's now, I uh, believe there's been a lot of work done on neuroligands and neuroaxins. They're important in synaptic plasticity. So they not only stabilize the synapse during the formation of synapses, but probably more importantly, they really determine synaptic plasticity. And as you, you may remember, I alluded to very early in the conversation, that synaptic plasticity is a very important part of learning and memory and in refining those neural circuits. Okay, so what does this really have to do with OPs? So this raised the question in our mind, if OPs are interfering with that morphogenic domain of acetylcholinesterase, and we have pretty solid data that suggests that's true, could they also be interfering with neuroligands function, particularly neuroligands function in synapse formation and stabilization? And so we have some preliminary data. This is not a finished story. We're at the very beginning stages of the story. So this data are preliminary. They're not yet published. Um, but we've done some experiments with culture rat hippocampal neurons, looking at what happens when we expose them to CPF. And we looked at markers of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. So our excitatory synapse marker was VGLUT1, and our inhibitory synapse marker was VGAT. These are basically transporter proteins. In the case of VGLUT1, it transports glutamate. In the case of VGAT, it transports GABA. And as Martha uh, Herbert told you this morning, uh, glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, whereas GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. What you can see here is looking at these graphs, and integrated intensity basically means the immunofluorescence for VGLUT1 or the immunofluorescence for VGAT, is that chlorpyrifos is knocking back that immunofluorescence, suggesting that it's interfering with both excitatory and inhibitory synapse, maybe formation or stabilization. We don't know which one yet, uh, but certainly it seems to be interfering with synapse um, density in these cultures. Now here's the really interesting part. We went ahead and took these preliminary data, and just sort of for giggles, we said, well, what's the ratio? If we look at the ratio of VGLUT1 to VGAT1, to so the ratio of excitatory to inhibitory, is that altered? And we got this very, very interesting finding. We see that at one of these concentrations, 0.01 micromolar CPF, we get a significant enhancement of the excitatory to inhibitory ratio. And again, as I indicated earlier, in some forms of autism, this seems to be an underlying pathology. Now this is kind of odd. We only see it at one concentration. It could be just an artifact of the culture system. But we have now repeated it five times because I didn't believe it the first four. And my postdoc has gotten the exact same finding each time with different cultures that are derived from independent um, animals. So it appears that this may be um, a, a, a real finding. Why that particular concentration, not the others, I really don't know. And that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer. So in order to really get at this question a little more deeply and to really start to look at the mutations that are associated with uh, autism, we have adopted a model that was originally developed by Peter Schifferle and his colleagues. And what this basically involves is transfecting COS7 cells with cDNA that expresses neuroligand. So this allows us to put in different neuroligands. As many of you may know, there are four isoforms of neuroligand. Isoforms three and four have been the ones implicated in autism. And the different neuroligands will drive differentially excitatory versus inhibitory synapses. And so an intriguing possibility is that these OPs may be differentially interfering with one subset of neuroligand isoforms and not another, which might alter that ratio of excitatory to inhibitory synapses. So this is just a picture that shows you what happens in the system. So you take your COS7 cells that are expressing neuroligand and you co-culture them with hippocampal neurons. So in this case, the red refers to neuroligand immunoreactivity. So we see our COS7 cells, which are expressing neuroligand, are red. And the green is norexin immunoreactivity. And norexin is expressed by the neurons. And so where you see these neurons growing over the top of the COS7 cell, you have yellow. Red and yellow, I mean, I'm sorry, red and green make yellow. So that's basically showing you that you have this co-localization of the neuroligand and the norexin, which is indicative of a synapse formation. To prove that that may be the case, um, this group, which is again, this is Peter Schifferle's group, did an experiment in which they took a mutant neuroligand one, which does not bind to norexin, expressed that in COS7 cells. And you can see in this case, there's no yellow. So the neurons were not able to form synapses on the COS7 cells that were expressing the mutant neuroligand one. So again, a very powerful experimental system that we can use to look at the differential effects of OPs on neuroligands one through four, and then on the mutant versus the wild type isoforms of neuroligand. So we have just started to really play with the system. 
um, we've got some very preliminary data again, and what our data are telling us is that CPF does indeed seem to be interfering with synaptogenesis in these hippocampal neurons that are co-cultured with the neural ligand transfected COS7 cells. So we've looked at synapse number in two different ways. One is by that immunofluorescence assay, assay that I showed you previously where we're immunostaining the cultures for VGLUT1 and then just quantifying the immunofluorescence. And what you see here is the level of immunofluorescence in cultures that hippocampal neurons that were cultured with COS7 cells that were mock transfected. So they have just a plasmid, MP plasmid, that's not expressing neural ligand. If we then co-culture them with the neural ligand expressing COS7 cells, we get a significant increase in synapse formation by this measure. And that is significantly decreased in the presence of chlorpyrifos, and this is a concentration-dependent effect. If we look using at synapse formation using a different assay, which is an ELISA for synaptophysin, we see something very similar. So again, in the absence of any neural ligand in the COS7 cells, we have very low levels of synapses being detected by this method. If we then uh, co-culture the hippocampal neurons with neural ligand expressing COS7 cells, we get a significant increase in synapse formation, and this is inhibited by treatment with chlorpyrifos. So uh, just a couple of very uh, preliminary control experiments that we run to determine whether this is really a specific effect, that the OPs are really interacting with the neural ligand itself. We looked to see what was happening with acetylcholinesterase in our system. And we do get an inhibition of acetylcholinesterase, but it's at relatively high concentrations relative to those that we saw decreased synapse formation. We also see no effect on cell viability of the co-cultures when we treat them with the concentrations of chlorpyrifos that interfere with synapse formation. Probably most importantly, we proved that chlorpyrifos was not just simply decreasing expression of neural ligand in the transfected COS7 cells. So this is the level of neural ligand immunoreactivity we see in the mock transfected um, COS7 cells. It's very low. This is the level that's increased significantly by transfection expression of the neural ligand um, cDNA. And this is what happens to levels by immunofluorescence when you expose them to chlorpyrifos. There's no difference. We've confirmed this now by Western blot, so it appears that's not the explanation for the decrease in synapse formation. So I wanted to sort of end the science part of it by, by a couple of sort of summary slides. One is, I think these data raise a really intriguing possibility that OP exposures during very critical periods of development may amplify ASD-related gene mutations in neural ligand on synapse formation. You heard earlier today in some of the presentations that while neural ligand mutations are one of the few single gene mutations that have been very strongly linked to ASD, that not all patients that carry the mutation actually express ASD. They're not on the spectrum. Why? Maybe it's because you need to have an environmental factor that interacts with that mutation to really drive the individual's developing brain over the brink into actually clinical manifestation. It also suggests that these OPs could be inter interacting um, not only with the mutations that have actually been definitively linked to ASD, but also other uh, genetic factors and or environmental factors that converge on neural ligand mediated synapse formation, and that together these are really altering patterns of neuronal connectivity that are associated with ASD. So what does this really mean to parents and clinicians? I think the really, the positive aspect of the work that I do, and this is what I keep reminding myself when I'm writing all those grants, is that from, from the perspective of the parent and the clinician, chemical exposures are more readily controlled than genetic factors to prevent or mitigate the expression of ASD-related traits. So I think it's really incumbent upon the scientists to really set up rigorous model systems that will allow us to identify what are the really bad players out there. We're not going to get rid of all chemicals in the environment. I, 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 echo, I want to echo what, what Martha Herbert said this morning, that we need to try and do that. But let's face it, the chemical industry is a huge industry in this country and other countries. Um, it's an economic situation. And there are times when these very nasty chemicals really are very helpful. Uh, so the, the important thing I think we need to strive for is to identify what are the really bad actors. Can we de develop some model systems, experimental model systems, that will allow us to really look at those chemicals that should be high on our hit list that we should really put our energy and our resources into controlling um, because we know it's going to have an impact on the clinical outcome in the children. <laughs>
The other thing I think this means is that there's now biological data to support the epidemiological data to really urge all parents and clinicians to minimize or prevent exposure to OPs during pregnancy or early childhood. That there really is hope that this could improve clinical outcome. So I noticed that there was a flyer that was being handed out at some point today on, on steps that you could take to decrease your exposure to environmental chemicals, and many of my suggestions are the same. So do not use OPs in the home or the yard. Consume organically grown produce. Um, I think it's important is that you also work with your local agencies to minimize use of OPs in public places. They're still using chlorpyrifos to spray schools and to spray tenements in inner cities to control cockroaches. Um, so I think it's really important that as a, as a public, we raise up against this practice. I think it's also important as, to parents and to clinicians to increase the, uh, the people who are using OPs to really notify the public when the OP spray schedules and locations are, are about to, to occur. I think another thing that's really important is to keep dust levels as low as possible in the home. And one that wasn't in the list is to wash stuffed toys routinely. Um, there's been a number of studies that have been done on OP exposures in children, many of these done by the University of Washington, that have demonstrated that in the home, the primary source or of exposure to OPs is dust in the home and then wash uh, these stuffed toys which tend to collect the dust and have very high levels of OPs which are not readily broken down in the home environment because they're not exposed to sunlight. And with that, I'd just like to end with acknowledgments to my colleagues who helped with these studies that I reported, Cecile Picard at Johns Hopkins University and Oksana Lockridge at University of Nebraska, the people in my lab, and then, of course, my uh, funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>